งแล้วค่ะแบบเฮ้ยอะไร people who are here with me lovely people uh, welcome to another session with us uh, at Walk with me I am Dr. t h e r e Farha I am a white person with a shaved head giant glasses and a giant hoodie because I ordered it and it came today and it's personalized so it says no things because I don't like doing things um, only stuff snackos and games and it's like a Um, and I'm joined today uh, also by Dr. Annette Foster because we're going to be covering uh, our discussions around the six common reactions of autistic discovery. Um, so I'm going to ask people to do introductions and their descriptions in a second. But we're also joined by Northern Naughty um, with all the Mayo pictures behind him. If you are. <laughs> <laughs> Just the mail. He's never seen sign of or northern a u t i before. This is what he looks like. So he's usually in the comments section and behind the scenes Yay! helping quite a lot. And we've also got lovely J Sick Feathers again because we had such a great time last time. Um, yeah. And so they're hopefully also going to have a discussion with us about this six common reactions and what we think about them and if we've missed stuff. Um, If that if it makes sense, if it sits well with people or not, that kind of thing. Um, so if I can ask um, Annette if you would like to do a description of yourself. Yes, I am a white autistic person with uh, long blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, I have an ovaly face, and I have a grey turtleneck jumper because I'm quite cold tonight, mm. and I'm sitting in a very white room. Um, it's quite boring, and I've got my um, octopus, happy, sad octopus that's reversible with me, which is blue and light blue. Nice. I like the sad, happy octopus. Um, <laughs> and j a s i c if you wouldn't mind doing description. Yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. I am also a white individual with bleach blonde a hair that's long on the top and short on the sides, um, and I'm wearing today a. Or I have green eyes, and I'm wearing today a rainbow tie-dyed crop hoodie, and I also have a happy <laughs> stem toy. This is a narwhal. <laughs> It does this with little like balls in it. It's weird. Um, it's like a like a jelly ball. That's awesome. <laughs> It looks like a sock kind of sock material. Is it like I love narwhal? Like yeah. That, so this is like this is a case like this part. I can take it off, um, and then the inside nice. is just that in my like, life. Yeah, it's 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 weird because I can like take it. Oh, that's it. amazing! Oh, we that's need that. Cool. Yeah. Oh wait, we need to find. Yeah, you have to send us a link to, to buy that. That looks really yes. cool. Yes, <laughs> sounds good. Yes. This is fantastic. You can have different um, covers depending on your day, but I love narwhals. Me too. That's right. Got them. <laughs> <laughs> And Sai is likely to use a uh, chat box quite a lot today, if um, not entirely uh, chat box. Um, so Sai says. <laughs> That they are a 20 plus plus something year old white male with thick, thick, glossy hair and not a ginger beard. Uh, just think a younger Jason the Moa wearing a Deadpool hoodie and Deadpool pants. Um, so to be clear, also Sai uh, is autistic with the demand avoidant profile. <laughs> oh, me um, too. And... I say that. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's just to explain that actually, if you are blind, um, then. They are more than a 20 s o m e t h i n g plus uh, male. Um, <laughs> they are very bold on the top. <laughs> I can say this because he's my friend, um, and they do have quite a ginger beard. <laughs> and he What says about, lies. Did we say the background? I mean, the oh. background is quite important. And the background is very important. So, for those of you who know, s a i usually posts at the end of our sessions um, whether the guest likes s a l a d cream or mayo. And um, mayo to s a i is the only acceptable answer. So, his background is all different sort of jars of mayonnaise, <laughs> which is very bizarre. <laughs> and he's typing. I can see him furiously typing. So, um, but yes, yeah, so s a i is going to use the chat box to communicate with us today. Um, so yeah, so Annette. Um, why are we here? So we're wanting to discuss our, um, our our discussion that we've had for quite a few years. And so I yeah. guess how did it come about that we started talking about um, the six reactions or common reactions of autistic discovery? Well, I mean, over the years, talking to so many autistic people, and a lot of the people that we talk to are usually at the beginning of their autistic discovery journey. Um, 
we kind of noticed that there was a lot of things that people had in common um, when they kind of discover that they're autistic. Um, and I think at some point you and I were supposed to be designing some kind of lesson or something. I can't remember. I, I think it was a program that we were designing we were for someone else. To- yeah put something yeah. short like a short what would um basically i was asked if i go back to the blog so if people are interested as well there's a blog that i wrote for this so depending oh, yeah. on how what is your preferred mode of learning and understanding things you can you listen to us you can read it if it's if reading is your preference and so on but um so basically i was asked um uh, when was it 2021 to come up with a short lesson that anyone autistic or their loved one might need to know when they first look into autistic experience and um, so they were asking what was the very first thing people would need that we could create and provide um and i explained in the blog so given that there is so much prejudiced and inaccurate information out there about autistic experience what are people actually looking for um, and actually, I might ask both Jasic and um, Sai. So Jasic, you're relatively new to your autistic discovery. So you're how old now? 28? I'm 28. Yep. Just turned And you discovered January. when you were 26? Uh, 26. Yep. And Sai discovered you were autistic in 20... 2018, 2019? 17. 2017. And then diagnosed 2018, 2019? 2018, 2019. Um, yeah. So relatively like newish although I discovered I was uh, autistic in 2017 as well to be fair um so yeah 20, what, 20, were, 20, what 11, were you for instance Jasic and Sai what were you looking for when when you started that discovery journey because I'm imagining you both did lots like lots of us do which is just research it to yeah. death yeah um so what were you looking for? What were you wanting? What did you need when you started looking into the fact that you're autistic? So for me, it actually is very tied to my um, my health for my connective tissue disorder. I was trying to figure out the connection because I had been diagnosed with ADHD when I was 23. And I was like, there has to be connection here. So I started reading a bunch of papers, like published scientific papers and um, discovered that like, ADHD patients have uh, a tendency to have a lot of hypermobility and um, a lot of they're like I forget the exact correlation the way that they described it but it, there's like something about um, our pain like we have like there's a correlation of pain with ADHD um, or with neurodivergence in general and so I, I kept digging and digging and then um, I was diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder in 2019. Um, but, I, but I was diagnosed coming off of Cymbalta the wrong way. So I was like literally losing my mind coming off of this medication because it did not work with my autistic body, period. Like it, it, it did the opposite effect. It like they said it activated my system. So I was literally in the hospital. It was a wild time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, they, but they diagnosed me with borderline after knowing me for an hour in this state. And it was obviously like I was clinging to it because I needed answers for like why I was experiencing all these symptoms that were described by borderline, like the the um, fear of abandonment and like impulse stuff and and mm-hmm. and a bunch of things. So I was like, okay, cool, this makes sense. And I got into DBT, and DBT is where things started to change for me. Um, I did a complete 180 essentially because I was given real tools and uh, was given the space to practice building skill with these tools to self-regulate, to communicate effectively, to handle crisis properly. Um, And it was like I was reborn essentially. (laughs) And so I was like looking at myself like, huh, DBT made me see that BPD is not my profile. This no longer cert, like this no longer makes sense, but I'm still different. Why, why am I still different? What is going on here? And then I started seeing in my hypermobile groups um, that oh, there's a lot of autism cor- correlation and overlap and a lot of neurodivergence in general. And I, like I said, already was ADHD. So I started asking my friends who were self uh, diagnosed or self-identified as autistic. I started really just like reaching out into neurodivergent groups. And suddenly I started to see myself for the first time, like reflected back to me in my community. And um, 
and with this trifecta of being being queer and then having hypermobility issues and pain like chronic pain and then seeing that autism and ADHD are prevalent all like this triangle triangular connection I'm like all right well <laughs> BPD wasn't right but um I'm seeing myself here so I think I'm gonna just go with I'm, I'm autistic <laughs> like, <laughs> and it, it sounds like it was a lot about uh, yeah trying to understand yourself so Sai for instance yeah. their, uh, his response is um what he was looking for was self-understanding and an explanation to why I was different mm -hmm. and belonging so wanting yep. to belong um as well so there's some key things there what were yeah. your thoughts on it oh well I was just thinking it's interesting because I was obviously diagnosed in 2011 but I probably really didn't fully understand and connect to community until around the time I met you Chloe really right before that I mean you know starting the PhD so 2016 yeah so, you know, it's interesting to think about, you know, all that time I didn't really have, I tried to connect to community, but I didn't, I, there was one group I went to, but it, it just, the people there just, we didn't, there was, I didn't see myself, if that makes sense. I think it was one person, it was only one or two women in the group anyway, so possibly at the time. Um, but yeah, I'm just thinking it's interesting because, it, you know, just dis discovery can happen anytime you can be diagnosed for ages and not really discover you're autistic, if that makes sense. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I was a person with autism for quite a long time. Um, yeah. Because I was and an that's, island. Yeah, that's what I would. Yeah. What we've talked about a lot, which is yeah. that particularly with some of our like our discovery programs and people that we might support in, in a more sort of professional capacity. Um, they might come into those spaces as people with autism spectrum disorder, which is a whole different narrative. They're very mm. isolated as people um, and not had or created or ever felt a real sense of belonging. Um, and then the idea is, yeah, how, what can we do to foster that change so that they feel more comfortable to be an autistic person, mm. um, but gently, because it's down to them. Um, I think what might come up, if, which I might forget, so I'm going to mention it now, which is when we talk through some of the six common reactions mm -hmm. is particularly what I know and what we know. Um, I forget because Annette's here as well, but I'm so used to doing these by myself and Annette's here now, which is really I've amazing, always I've been here. here. <laughs> I know, but like for the first couple of like 18 oh, months yeah. I have to request for Annette who's never actually here, which is really interesting. And people are like, um, oh, it's actually Annette. Annette, she like, exists. They're a real person. Yeah, they're a real person. Um, so, yeah, so some of the, particularly with young people um, who are maybe recognised as children or uh, adolescents, um, they, they, I feel, have quite a tough time in the sense of there's a lot of more denial and anger and rejection and dismissal mm -hmm. of mm. the diagnosis because of the the way that they are discovered is usually when they're really distressed and really struggling. So we can talk about that a bit more in more detail. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because um, we had one uh, pupil drop out of our autistic discovery program um, because they they said, you know, um, autism is only a part of me. And, and I so because we were talking in a very positive way and all this kind of thing. So yeah. they just weren't ready yet. Um, no. They might not ever be ready. But I hope that at some point in the future, they come back to their discovery. And I think that's really important as well, that that there is no standard discovery either, like your journey of recognising and working it out and all this kind is very, um, very individual. Yeah. yeah, there's no um, right or wrong way to do it. And, you know, we talk about common reactions, but you could be feeling two common reactions at the same time or, you know, have one and then jump to another and then back to the same one. So it's not like, uh, you know, <laughs> there's any order to this or any right or wrong way to experience it. But I think it's important. And I think what me and Chloe really wanted to say with this is that it's important to acknowledge that we go through the, these kind of reactions because, and that it's common, like other autistic people go through this because a lot of times if you're not a part of a community, you don't know that. You think you like, I'm, you know, what's wrong with me, you know? Um, and I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge that this is all part of 
of, of kind of discovering that you're autistic. And, you know, I hope that someday, you know, maybe people don't have to go through so much denial and anger um, that, you know, we can, you know, that the autistic community is so much a part of just normal society or whatever society that, you know, there's acceptance is already there, you know, and that, um, you know, and some people might have experienced that already been, you know, found the autistic community very quickly. Um, you know, and I think we might need to come back to that as well and remember that, which is why do we see people and a number of us included who do start off with quite negative feelings about being autistic. And that's really important to acknowledge that those feelings are 100 percent valid. Yeah. Nobody should be made to feel guilty or, or, or bad or anything that you feel negative. Um, yeah. It can be quite difficult coming into the autistic community who largely, you know, depends where you go, what social media, which is always difficult, um, where they're already got a particular, there's a particular narrative. And so I, I, there's a bit of an issue with people being driven away because then they don't have the language yet and things because they're right at the start of their discovery. And we, we as a community are so traumatised from no, so many things, but we need to just be a little bit kinder to those newly discovered autistic people because yeah. it's... Yes. Their, your anybody's feelings about how, you know how they respond to understand they're autistic whether they're ableist or not they're still how that person feels and we need to help those individuals um, to some extent to like move through different different reactions or just acknowledge that those are okay um, I just want to flag for people because there've been some lovely comments and questions so I'm I just want you to know I've starred them in the hopes that we can come back to them. Um, I'm just going to quickly just double check in. I'm just thinking you should probably get on with the PowerPoint, Chloe. Okay. So, well, basically, <laughs> so what happened, we were asked, like I said, 2021, come up with something. Um, and I just wanted to know what were people looking for? And I was thinking about, to, what was I looking for? Um, and I was looking for, and because I was lucky enough that I was really already interested in neurodiversity and neurodivergence, that was my, my education and my academic background and my research interests. So I knew what to avoid, actually because I was like, well, I'm not going to go in, I'm a depathologized academic, so I'm not going to go down looking at all the pathologizing uh, work and things that exist on the internet. So what are other people actually looking at or for? Because they won't necessarily know that. So I did a bite size on Academy um, and just asked, what were you looking for when you realized you were autistic? And lots of people came up with different things. So there was things like, I was looking for an educator, someone to guide me through the feelings, emotions I was going through and try to normalize those feelings. Uh, wanting to find out you're not alone, checking for similarities, to know that it's not scary to be autistic, the correct information to be aware of and finding the community, finding your folks, the different ways one might react to finding out they're autistic. I thought I would feel relieved, but that wasn't my first reaction. I really struggled with all the different feelings and that lack thereof I went through um, and how to communicate your needs to other people. And so all of those different things, I was like, they all have a common thread um, as well, which is to know that you're not alone, basically. Yeah. Know that you're normal in quotation marks in the sense of you're a perfectly autistic person um, <laughs> having all sorts of responses. So as Annette said, we've met so many autistic people and supported so many autistic people in different capacities. Um, and we'd already been talking about things like how you, when you recognize you're autistic as an adult, for instance, so for those of us that weren't recognized or discovered until we, we were older, so we weren't children necessarily, um, we would talk about how we would review our life with that new lens. And you start looking back and going, yeah oh, that time that people were mean to me about that thing that I did, actually they were bullying an autistic person. And, and so we started talking about these things. Um, yeah, and so then we came up. Yeah, reevaluating. Reevaluating your entire life. I mean, that's what I did when I, I <laughs> to think about it. It's like every interaction, every, you know, going back over everything and realizing, oh, that's why that happened. Oh gosh, that's why that person did that. I just want to pop this for, for Sai as well, which is um, so that we don't, forget size also contributing here so um, I realized I was autistic 2017 and officially diagnosed in 2019 I went through denial for about a year after diagnosis with periods of anger for not being noticed the injustices etc but was quickly accepting of being autistic and actually I met Sai at um, uh, an autistic pride that we did on uh, the University of Kent campus and he came I think did you come with Oggy? No. 
I think you came with stim things. Probably you? in the van. Probably in the van. So Oggy is um, Sai's um, uh, gorilla friend that he takes everywhere. Um, so let's pop on the screen. Everyone knows how much I love slides. Oh, there's That's Oggy. Like, there's Oggy. Oggy. <laughs> 30 odd years old is old yeah. Oggy. Um, so this is the six common reactions or phases of autistic discovery. Um, and we had some feedback. Twitter can be quite harsh, but I did take the feedback um, and uh, process it and sit with it for a little while. That initially when I described the six stages uh, or, or common reactions, it felt too linear and um, I numbered them for ease, but they weren't meant to be viewed as like this process of linear, you go through these things. So that was helpful feedback, if painful feedback because the way it was delivered. Um, but that's what Twitter is like, sadly, some of the time. Um, so the six yeah. common reactions or phases of autistic discovery. Um, and so this is now uh, a PDF and um, uh, a photo, a, a picture that if people want to share it with people. But in terms of how do I actually skip through? This is I don't often do it this way. So I'm like, how do I do it? Or should we just go through the, the six stages? Oh, I've just done full screen. Which yeah. <laughs> Oh no, I did, I've done this before and I'm not sure why I can't work out where the little button is that makes it skip through. Okay, don't worry, I can do it from over here I think, hold on. Oh, the technology. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so we've got, should I just list them now while you're doing this, Chloe? So we've got denial, in, like oh, in imposter. Here we go, here we go. Here we go. Oh, oh, I've, no, I've got it to go. work, I, found, I figured it out. Okay. Hey. Um, I was okay with the last slide. Okay, go ahead. Oh, it was a bit small for everybody. I've, yeah. I've got it much bigger so that you can go through it, uh, Annette. Okay. Um, so to be very clear, again, because of feedback, but it already had things like this, but we may experience one or more of the six phases of autistic discovery. We may move forwards and backwards. We could, might get stuck at one for several years, for instance. We might skip through different reactions. Um, there's no one way to go through your autistic discovery journey which is ongoing and lasts a lifetime so even though um, you know we educate about autistic experience we ourselves will always be going through our autistic discovery journey because we're always working out new things about ourselves um, so it might be that you experience one or more of the reactions common reactions that we describe in a minute or none of them you might have something completely different and that's also okay but these are just the common reactions that um, we started noticing here you go in it oh yes yeah, so we've got um, denial, um, imposter syndrome. Um, I don't do that thing, therefore I'm not autistic. Or the diagnosis was wrong. <laughs> or maybe I'm not autistic. Maybe I just thought I was autistic. Or, you know, other people, you know, to a certain extent, you've got that denial, but you've also got other people saying, you're not autistic because you're not like my brother's sister's son's son. <laughs> 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 and they're a certain way of being autistic and therefore you're not you, then you go oh my god maybe i'm not autistic you know so it, it's that kind of that yeah i went through that quite a lot back and forth you know even after i was diagnosed actually um looking at um and and that's not really important really um to have a diagnosis necessarily but for me i did have one because that's how i found out i was autistic um but yeah i think uh, my experience was yeah back and forth at kind of and 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 depending on other people's reactions as well because when you're having people tell you well you don't look autistic or you don't act autistic or you have too much empathy to be autistic then you're like well maybe i'm not i don't know it's very confusing can i just say I that empathy myth drives me freaking bonkers I hate it that was one of the driving forces of why i suffered with imposter syndrome for so long because I believe that the stereotype of you have to be, you know, analytical and have no emotion or at least don't show it and like not be able to communicate with people when I'm like hyper, <laughs> all of those things. Anyway, sorry. Exactly. So this is just helping to see and show that, you know, do these things make sense to people that we've, we've, you know, said are potentially common reactions. Might be called something different. You might not call them these things per se. Sure. But uh, yeah, same thing. Like I don't have meltdowns, so I didn't think I could be autistic. I have shutdowns. Mm. But you know, this is the issue with the mainstream non-autistic autism community um, yeah. 
way of explaining autism is you don't see yourself unless you are an incredibly narrow stereotype. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, I guess we've already sl slightly st started to get into the whole, well, why do we potentially have negative reactions when we discover, like denial, um, and we're, we're obviously going to talk about anger and depression and so on, but we do I mean, because of the stereotype. Really? <laughs> but also because, uh, you know, if you do... It's interesting because if you discover you're autistic, I almost feel like sometimes it's better than finding out when you're diagnosed because it's so pathologized when you're diagnosed yeah. that it's so negative. And you think you're going to have answers when you have a diagnosis, when you get that piece of paper that says you're autistic and why. But all it does is kind of make you feel really horrible about yourself because you're like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm in deficit in so many ways. But also, but there's no, you know, it's like, well, what do I do now? And and basically, they don't tell you. <laughs> they say, well, you're autistic. Yeah, that's it. Um, and to a certain extent, you have to find that, you know, there's no information. And I think, well, that definitely needs to change. That's why it's so great if you do find out through the community and, and not through diagnosis to discover that, that you have answers and that's where yeah me and Chloe thought it was really important at first to make sure that we put together good resources for people because there's so much negative stuff online and pathologies pathologize things online that you know you can go and just just feel even worse about yourself that's basically the reason we do everything it's the reason we do academy is because we just didn't want people to have to go through or not go through for maybe as long, those quite negative feelings or seeing the awful nonsense that's online and things like that to actually, I always say scoop, scoop autistic people who are interested, obviously <laughs> not against their will, um, but interested to come and learn about themselves in uh, hopefully, you know, safe and comfortable space. Um, because we were putting together things that we would have wanted when we realized we were autistic basically we were like what did we want it was good information it was what does it even mean for me as an autistic person um because we've said multiple times you know a lot of the time diagnosis for instance doesn't really give you answers if you do have a diagnosis because not everybody um for whatever reason there might be multiple reasons but not everybody gets a diagnosis um but it just gives you more questions than it does answers and like i say i'm angry every week at the moment when i do in training talking about this topic because i always ask why did i do the frog book in my diagnosis assessment i still don't understand why i did the frog book what that tells me about my autistic brain um and so all my answers really or a lot of my answers because it's ongoing have come from the community um and that's so i, I feel mean, free to let us know about your did you experience denial yeah, I've put a bit there. Oh, you've put a bit there. Denial, but I uh, saw the bit about bargaining. Was there one I've missed about? Sorry, Annette, carry on. Oh, I was just going to say, oh, 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 Jasic. Yeah, sorry, Jasic's still there. It's because of the comment. Oh, because of the comment. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, Jasic. I can't remember what I said now. I, I, I think I was thinking... I can't remember. I've lost it. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so I'll just read Sai's comment, which is that uh, Sai's denial came from always being told I'm wrong and constant invalidation to finally have an answer seem too good to be true as well. So that's interesting that an answer might be too good to be true. I remember um, as well what I was going to say. Um, because diagnosis is based on behavior and not the understanding of what is behind that behavior, that is why we don't get any, I'm just thinking about, it, that's why we don't get any answers, where the autistic community knows the, the reason behind the behavior. So we can then say, okay, these are the things that we can do. It's, yeah, just thought about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So then, so we've just done denial. So yes. <laughs> let's do. Um, oh, anger. we kind of did anger as well, didn't we? Okay. We talked about so, reevaluating your life, but mm -hmm. they're kind of bit. connected, aren't they? Yeah. Very, I would say. And and I find the anger quite interesting because again, there seems to be. But remembering we're all different, um, there seems to be an interesting thing relating to anger, dependent on again how old you are when you discovered you were autistic. So it feels like not all at all but some of the young people we meet are more likely to be angry at the autism mm -hmm. like they're angry at the autism the autism 
is the bad thing. It's making their lives miserable and all this kind of thing. And that's really sad to hear because we can't be separated from our autism. So what they actually mean is I don't like myself mm. because yeah. the autism, if, if, if we are working with individuals, young people who say that they're angry at the autism, they wish they didn't have autism, I kind of go with how they're understanding it at that point and we'll say, you know, but it's not poor autism's fault. You need to be kind to autism. It's the world that's being, yeah. that's not right for your autism because at that point they're still distancing themselves from that idea of autism. So you kind of have to work with that. Um, mm. But really what you want is to them to be kind to autism because then they might be kind, kind to themselves. themselves. Yeah. Um, but that seems to be much younger. Oh, I'll come to you. Yes, JC. Sorry, two seconds. Um, no, am I going to make you lose it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you see that more with the with young people angry at autism. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I started, we started putting this together. I hadn't had that. I didn't write that because I didn't think about it because I wasn't angry at the autism. I was angry about being invalidated for so long, at being um, gaslit for my experiences, for being told over and over again you're cold you're standoffish you're unapproachable and those things hurting um mm. and things like that so it, i was angry about that and then meeting younger people i was realizing that there's actually other ways we might be angry yeah. so sorry jc um, no i i'm glad i'm glad i didn't interrupt because <laughs> that was <laughs> that was definitely um some good stuff to say and honestly like you just described my experience anyway i was going to come in and say um i think with younger people, I mean, as young people, we are, unless we're taught to have very independent critical minds, we're kind of at the whim of our environment. Like we're, we're very conditioned as, as human beings. We have, you know, school and parents, other friends, um, doctors, literally everybody telling us what reality really is. And like, it's up to us to grow into ourselves as, as adults and figure out, hmm, what's actually true about that like what's actually true here and what's actually true for me and I I didn't have that voice for myself until like when I came out as queer at 25 so like it takes time and people don't find that voice until they're like 50 sometimes or older like this stuff happens so I think it's like definitely down comes down to personal experience obviously but um I do think with younger people it's it's because we're told like this, this is what your reality is. And that reality is pathologized. So no wonder they're angry at the autism instead of at the injustice of the world. Cause that's, you described my experience as an adult discovering because I was so angry looking back about the invalidation, the gaslighting, the, the um, dismissal, the like condescension, like all of those ugly things that humans do to each other because superiority complex or whatever. Like I, I was angry at that. I was angry at circumstances. I was angry at mi missing opportunities and being um, pushed aside for things. Um, always being the butt of a joke. Like I, it's other people. It's not me. Yeah. I finally, I finally got to accept me and realize that I wasn't broken. I wasn't wrong. I was just different. And there was a reason for that. And it was okay. Like that part was really reassuring once I got over the anger at other people. And I still, it's not linear. I still get stuck there sometimes mm. when I'm thinking about stuff. Like, and, and this has been two years after just And that's so, that's so important that everybody recognizes that, that at some point you might get onto positive responses and reactions to being autistic, but you might still have times or whole years where you go back to being angry or even going back to being in denial. And that's okay. Um, I just want to flag there's a number of people um, who said things about, so for Amanda, I was angry that I hadn't been discovered before. It would have saved a lot of trauma. Um, mm -hmm. I'm angry my life was so hard and I had so little support. Um, and Andrew, I remember the anger I felt at people not explaining my report to me. Um, and I really understood it when I started studying autism and Asperger's syndrome as a master's. So, yeah, lots of people also acknowledging the anger so I, I'm kind of I'm glad that these are maybe making sense for people yeah I mean I I just wanted to say that I was you know I got angry at all those things as well at, at um you know being the butt of the joke and always you know being the person that people laughed at and you know teased because it was fun to tease me because I yep. reacted um by friends 
you know, these are, you know, you know, my yes. friends. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> but also, when I started my PhD and looked into the autism research and looked into all the information about autism at the time, I was angry at the researchers. I was angry, in, well, I was angry in particular at one particular person, Simon Baron Cohen, um, at the, 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 the bias the male bias um, oh. in autism research and, yeah. um, you know, really angry that I was misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed for, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and yeah, that was something that I wrote a letter basically to Simon Baron Cohen, <laughs> which I performed um, in um, one of the performance adventures of Super Aughty Girl. But um, yeah, basically saying that and that things need to change and that, you know, ultimately next generation of autistic people will not have to feel as though you know they have to be even angry at the autist autistic researchers but we'll see I, I really appreciate you bringing that up about researchers like i i'm seeing now now that i'm like involved right that i'm actually doing my own like research i mean it's reading and digging and everything like why, why is it like, there is no excuse at this point in the 21st century to have research about autism, not being led by autistic people, not, and, and, and I don't want a cure. I don't want to figure out what gene is responsible. Yeah. Cause that, that's a slippery slope into eugenics, but I do want to understand the, the complications of living as an autistic person in the world that doesn't serve us. Like, let's research that let's research how to make lives better instead of like for accommodations instead of trying to figure out what's the what's the starting point like i don't yeah there's so much wrong in the research <laughs> realm of things and yeah still and, sorry go on oh still yeah i think yeah we need to figure out how to make the lives of autistic people better that's the most yeah. important thing yep. um, nothing about us without us right like I mean, yeah. I've said yeah. this before, so. <laughs> I mean this has been our argument for ages my my the the talk that gets one of the talks that gets asked to be hosted the most is my autistic well-being what works um, and it's mm. about why therapy might not work for a large number of us um, and what potentially might actually work and that's about learning your needs as an autistic person Long. Um, learning your needs as an autistic person um, and connecting and not feeling alone and that's by other autistic people none of that really involves non-autistic people um, because like I say you just don't get the answers you need if I were to sit in some of the the horrendous sounding post-diagnostic or what's touted as post-diagnostic support in certain services all it tells you is the outdated theories and why autism is a disorder and all this kind of thing. It's like, that doesn't tell me how to live my life as an autistic person. That doesn't tell me why I do that thing, why I need to do other things that actually might help me. Um, and so many people as well saying things like, um, so we've got another Chloe here. Um, I'm usually angry at not being discovered younger, but sometimes slip into the angry at being autistic even after a couple of years. And that is okay, um, yeah, other Chloe, um, because we will keep going backwards and forwards. Um, we've got somebody here um, with younger people. So their daughter who's seven has this, I hate being autistic, yet they've worked hard to build a positive identity. We are human with a brain that processes different, but so does everyone else. They, uh, Their neurotypical school aren't right and we are not wrong. I have often wondered if it was the damage caused by going down the wrong road. We went down straight after identification has autism stuff. It's, <sighs> a lot of it is not people's fault it's just what's no. out the dominant narrative is all dominant narrative disorder, not yeah. autistic people and yeah. that's trying to avoid that is really really hard um we've got katie i'm angry at myself for not accepting the first diagnosis they had you know so there's that denial there there's just so so many things um that so that many people, people do that respond with um so that was anger. Um, yeah. <laughs> Annette, do you want to pick one? Because remember, oh. none of these are in order. So you might, yeah. you know, go straight to other phases. But so they're well, not in order. OK, I'll pick depression then. OK. Um, and yeah, or is it autistic burnout? And I think that's something really mm. to look at, um, you know, for my life, um, obviously, going through that cycle of masking, um, 
a lot of it subconsciously um, and going to, you know, even as a kid going to school and, and, and doing that all day long um, and then burning out from it and being months where I couldn't do anything um, looked a lot like depression. Um, but, you know, then I would go into a phase, almost like a hyperactive phase where I'd be like, oh, yes, I have energy. I'm going to do things. And, and you know, having that cycle and then back into burnout again, <laughs> that cycle over and over. But also, you know, um, I, you know, I, I did experience depression in my life as well. I mean, anxiety and depression are hand in hand um, as an autistic person. So there's kind of those, there's kind of different things but then do you think is that i mean ultimately the depression was based on my experience at the time of being un undiagnosed autistic so mm -hmm. and not being able to not knowing anything about um my experience of the world and how that was different and how to to, to be able to manage that and and to be able to um regulate my sensory experience of the world mm -hmm. Um, like, but you know sadness there's sadness as well which we don't have in here but I think there's there was a lot of sadness when I discovered finally and knew that I was autistic that you know like we said it, it anger and sadness kind of come together as well it's like you're angry but then you're also sad that like I mean I talked about this last time that you know I didn't maybe my self-esteem would have been better you know if I'd known 20 years ago <laughs> that I was autistic um, you know all those things too yeah. I think it's difficult because obviously we can't know because it's hindsight. Mm. Would we have been better off knowing when we were younger? Because obviously we've worked with people who have known since they were like, you know, seven or whatever. And actually they don't necessarily have a positive outlook no. on themselves mm -hmm. um, because they connect all the struggles to autism for instance and it's like sadly you are not struggling because of autism you yeah. are struggling because the world is not built for us right. um but I, so i wonder you know i had a tough like most of us a tough childhood tough teenage years but not because people were pathologizing me as a person with autism for instance and putting me in um certain education settings that maybe actually would have been even more traumatic than the one i was already yeah. in so it's really hard to know given how autism is understood at this point in time in the wider society, not outside of spaces like ours, um, whether it's better or not to know younger or not. I think it obviously it will depend on the narrative of, of what's around that person and the support they're getting. Um, so Amanda's also said up in the comment section that their daughter's 18 hates that they talk about autism all the time. And that Amanda has to be mindful that this is her journey, as in the daughter's journey. Um, so I think it's interesting because, Annette, you, we can't know. Would you have been better off knowing when you were yeah. younger? You know, and given the, the time when we would have been autistic in school, for instance, would have been different to now would that be the oh yeah i mean yeah i mean i would have wanted like the academy to exist and all the you know right. everything that we have now um for yeah. me you know i guess a sadness for the younger self you know that they the younger all the younger autistic people really that the, the things they have to go through and i think it's interesting as well because that's one of the things that people told me is now you talk about be autism all the time so once I was, I've discovered, it was like, you talk about it all the time and you're more autistic than you were <laughs> when, before you got diagnosed, like you're now you're in, and, and, and it wasn't that I was more autistic. It was just that I realized and I was making choices. I was creating boundaries like, okay, I'm mm -hmm. autistic. I'm not going to go do that thing. And people were like, but you used to be able to do that thing. It's like, no, I didn't used no. to be able to do that thing. No. I just did it to help you, to make you feel better. That's really interesting because we don't really necessarily have that as a stage per se on here, mm, but it's certainly, mm. like you say, something that happens. We might start uh, to greatly demask or drop our shields in certain circumstances when we feel safe to maybe, or just because we just had enough and all that kind of thing. And we might shave our heads and, you know, all <laughs> sorts of things. When, yeah, so that's, that's important actually um, and interesting that I don't know whether it fits in exactly with what, what, what we've got here. So it might be an other, another thing that needs to go up. But it, there is about demasking, I guess. So it kind of falls under that to some extent, which is not doing it anymore. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, in relation yeah. to depression, so we've got Katie saying depression is now my thing in my post-second diagnosis in modern DSMs, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, I accept, but I'm aware of depression and burnout and distinguishing um, distinguishing them now. Um, and and yeah, that's quite important. So it's important and hard. Reason- to do. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. It's important and hard to do. It's hard to. Yeah. Yeah. It's trial and error every single time until you finally do it enough to learn the habit of it and the cycle of it and like actually distinguish boundaries and keep those boundaries and honor who you are in different spaces. Like it is, it is a freaking it's a, it's a journey on its own, you know, like, um, anyway, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Um, and so I saying, I used to be depressed and angry because I didn't understand myself or the world, but now it's mostly due to inaccessible services. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that depression can be all sorts of things like, yeah, recognizing and getting depressed and sad that because it is it can be depressing if you start looking into and recognizing how autistic people, us, are thought of and considered. And particularly if you aren't, you know, if you are later discovered or if you're a young person and it wasn't really explained to you and then you you are more aware of it as you get older, for instance, you don't want to be looking into uh, spectrum 10k and what they are trying to do in terms of mm. genetics and things you know so things like that those are times when I get still on my discovery journey incredibly depressed um, I'm not going to go into details but you know um, so trigger warnings where are my trigger warnings um, <laughs> discussion around certain things we might be discussing uh, like suicide and suicidal ideation but I do at times when I when I think about how we are every time we take the tiniest half step forward in getting people to understand and embrace us as autistic people, we're taken back like 10 steps or 10, (laughs) 10 years by certain narratives, certain documentaries and things like that. And, and that's when I get incredibly low because Mm. I'm like, I am, we are all busting our butts to try and improve things for other autistic people because we do not want any other autistic people to suffer the way that maybe some of us have suffered, for instance. Mm. And then when you've got things like that, you know, really problematic studies that aren't about our well-being at all, you know, yeah, I have had before Christmas with the whole boycott Spectrum 10K campaign with a number of us working our asses off to, you know, campaign against it, uh, what I class as unalive thoughts, which is not the same as suicidality. So it's it's not the same as um, wanting or planning to to not be here but just wishing you weren't because it's exhausting so it's slightly different if that makes sense to people um and then yeah how do we start picking apart am i depressed or is it burnout um so like joseph says it's quite it can be very difficult and i do talk about it again in the well-being what works video because depression is a psychological thing as in the sense of very low mood um you might not always know why so sometimes it's quite difficult to pick that apart <clears throat> whereas burnout is an autistic thing um and that's more about regulation and that you've been doing too many things you've been peopling too much or whatever it might be um so they that, but they look very similar in terms of how you experience things like lethargy um exhaustion maybe crying um not being able to get out of bed all those kinds of things but for me, the way I always try to explain, I know now how to pick apart, am I depressed or is it burnout, is I feel hopeful when I'm in burnout. Like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, I know it's going to pass. When I was, Whereas in the past, when I've definitely had it really quite um, extreme depression, there's no hope. I felt absolutely hopeless. However, if you don't know it's burnout, then you, you're more likely not to feel that hope. You're, you, so yeah, it is really hard. It's only until you you realize, okay, this is burnout. You know that is a thing, that then you have that kind of hope. And I think for me, massive change in my life can create a burnout as well, which really does feel like depression. Um, But I know if I have a massive change, and everything changes overnight, like moving house, something like that, um, that can be a really massive trigger for me to just go, go into a really bad burnout. Um, So just thinking about you know, change in your life or, or if you're really stressed or, you know, anything like that is, it is more likely that a lot of times those things are going to be burnout as an autistic person and not depression. 
And, and so, Katie again makes the point that you know you can experience both at the same time as of well. Of course, right? yes. So yeah, yeah. And, and that's why it can be quite quite difficult, quite complicated. And particularly if you are burnt out, it could then potentially be much easier to fall into a depression as well because you might have some negative self talk around. But I'm not doing things. I should be doing things. You know that kind of. Thing. So there's lots. There's so much that can get um, tied up in that. Um, yeah, and if you have a gardening. history of depression, that's yeah, yeah, it's more likely that you could go into a depression from a burnout, which is yeah. So yeah, bargaining. So I, it's quite interesting because bargaining, you've got fine and high functioning, but I think a lot of times it's also um, thinking well. It's so connected. Everything's so connected because it's like maybe I'm not autistic, but yeah. <laughs> well, or I know I'm I knew trying a lot to find of women who actually were like, or people in general that that um, felt that well maybe I shouldn't get a diagnosis because you know I'm really not I don't want to take the diagnosis away from other people that might be struggling more than me and you know I've heard that a lot from people like oh I don't want to you know, maybe I shouldn't even say I'm autistic because I don't want to take that away, you know, the struggling of other people away, which I thought that's such an autistic thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, Sai, so, I mean, for here, we've got Sai saying, I didn't really have bargaining, although during my discovery period, I identified as Aspie, so uh, Asperger's, um, because that's all I knew. I didn't consider myself high functioning, uh, though. But yeah, so... I guess that whole bargaining thing, like I say, it doesn't have to be this um, necessarily this negative thing of, of fine, but I'm I'm high functioning. Um, but it certainly could be well, but I'm not like those other autistic people who are really struggling. And like you said, out of almost like a guilt as well that, but I don't deserve support. <laughs> I, I'm not struggling that badly. Burns out all the time, gets depressed all the time, has anxiety all the time, can barely do typical jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah yes Jasic. No. i just it's it's hysterical not hysterical but it's like really interesting to me in my own journey and i see it other places of like how insidious internalized ableism is like our society is so ableist that when we finally have that shimmer of hope that light at, at the end of the tunnel of like oh maybe this describes who i am and maybe I could get accommodations. Oh, but I'm not like, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. And you just listed so many things that are high functioning, you know, people experience. And it's like, y'all, it's okay. It's okay to want support for those things, to not have those experiences because that's not, you know, I, yeah, neurotypical people have their own versions of depression, anxiety, et cetera, but like, and maybe even their own burnout, but like, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not something that we have to deny ourselves. Like let the world do that for us. Like at least let us advocate for ourselves and, and find what works for ourselves and, and not stop it before it starts. You know, I just, oh, ableism, it sucks. It sucks so much. <laughs> yeah, and that might tie into again. Katie's got some really keen comments today. Um, so it says uh, it's actually literally bargaining with other people yeah. and organisations as well. Absolutely. So that's interesting. Okay, so another way of looking at this idea of bargaining is that we might be, yeah, trying to bargain. I do deserve it though, you know. Yeah, mm. bargaining with the outside neurotypical world that actually we do deserve support. Yep. Doesn't matter that the majority of the time. But I say majority, not always. I can use mouth words, for instance, and things like that. Like that's not an indication of how disabled I am right. in other settings um, and things like that. So, yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, it's like stages. Uh, because people... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Um, it's, it's like you saying that. It kind of to me, there's like stages within bargaining because like you have to you have to bargain with yourself to get out of that headspace of ableism, and then you have to further bargain like Katie was saying, with your your circumstances, with organizations and people about, no, this really is me and I deserve accommodation. Like that's, wow, I, I have never looked Katie, at it like that. Katie is on it today. So right? Katie says, I'll act, I'll act less autistic if you give me this yeah. nugget of support, <laughs> for instance. Um, that's really, yeah, that is interesting that we can look oh. at that bargaining in a different way. And I think what's really important 
is to acknowledge, and it's an uncomfortable thing for many of us to acknowledge, is that we might have done that. We might have said to ourselves, fine, but I'm not like those, in quotation marks, words that we don't like, low-functioning autistic people. Um, but many of us also then come to a realisation and an acceptance and realise that that's internalised ableism and realise, actually, I have so much more in common with a learning a person with learning disability who's also autistic for instance than I do a non-autistic person and we start yeah. to realize that we've been indoctrinated into that idea of what is a valuable valued human being <laughs> yeah right? right so I think we need to acknowledge in our, our community that there are those internalized ableism uh, uh, feelings and thoughts and they are uncomfortable and we don't want to have to admit them. But I think it's really important. And that's why it's on there. It looks uncomfortable. It makes us feel uncomfortable. But if you feel that, that is your feeling and that's valid. And we need to acknowledge it so that we can then help work out that actually we don't have to feel like that. We can move on from that feeling. So a number of people were quite angry with me on Twitter, which like I say, Twitter is not the best place because I had things like that on there and they were saying I was promoting ableism, et cetera. And it's like, no, I'm acknowledging that we do feel like this because we internalize ableism. Um, and to pretend that we don't doesn't help anyone. And <laughs> we shouldn't be shaming or guilting, making people feel guilty that they do feel that. We're already wrong in lots of societies we and, and communities. We don't need to feel wrong for our, for our feelings um, in the community uh, yeah. we exist in. I think we should actually add that to their internalized ableism because I think also it's discovering all your internalized ableism. Yep. So looking at the, the way you speak to yourself in your head, you know, yep. all the words that people said to you that you adopted, like I'm lazy, I'm crazy, I'm, you know, I can't do anything, I should do this, I should do that, I should do that, you know, and actually going, oh, okay, there's a reason why I don't do that. And actually, am I lazy? No, I'm not lazy. I'm I'm dealing with burnout constantly. So it, it's it's kind of like discovering as well that internalized ableism within yourself, um, because most of your life, well, depending how you know when you're diagnosed or when you discover, um, you can go through that for years and not even realize that that is internalized ableism. Yep, that codified language. Oh my God. It's, that's also insidious. <laughs> like how, well, how we talk about Cy, it and narrate for ourselves. Oh my god! And Sai says here, um, I find that I have to say I have autism mm. rather than autistic to get an understanding from their perspective, from th things like local authorities, and and he feels gross, you know, and and that's a difficult thing for us as well, um, because we're still navigating a world that doesn't understand and appreciate. The community language and and things like that. Um, Annette, are you making a note about how we might update that bargaining bit as well? Yeah, yeah. And I was just also thinking about when people have to apply for PIP or um, which is um, support for people with disabilities um, for JSIC. Um, um, is is that actually you know you have to be your worst self for that to yeah. go to that appointment? You have to like say your worst day ever. You know you have to basically you know. It feels like lying, especially to autistic people, to do something like that. And yeah. but that's the only way that you're going to get support as an autistic person. Um, yeah, so just thinking out loud about. That. And yeah, a, a post because I was getting again frustrated. I think I should just leave lots of social media platforms. But it was LinkedIn, <laughs> and LinkedIn is decades out of like behind in terms of understanding neurodiversity, and it's very much about profiting from so-called neurodivergent skills or special superpowers and all that kind of thing if they do talk about neurodiversity so it's about squeezing autistic people or otherwise neurodivergent people into an already broken system if they have some sort of shiny skill that they think they can profit from which is wholly ableist and disgusting yep. um but i was getting really angry because i for some reason and it does sadly, uh, I, I really hate when I have to generalize um, because, but sadly this ha is happening and it's a stereotype, is that the people that pushed back against a post that I made, which is about how training by neurotypical people um, 
pushing of the neurodiversity narrative, but in neurodiversity light, in quotation marks, like TM, um, within like organisations and businesses and things like that. Um, and the way that they will push it is, oh, well, they've got all these deficits and disorder and so on, but they might have superpowers and be geniuses and savants and holding up largely white male geniuses um, who are either celebrities or famous or from like or historical figures who actually we have no right to assign an identity to when they have they have no autonomy to turn around and say that's not my identity so that angers me um but the people that had pushback against it when i said we shouldn't be doing this we're allowed to be boring and bog standard and average to be worthy of life um the people that were pushing back were largely white male autistics and i feel it's that internalized ableism again they're bargaining they yeah. can feel better about themselves and that's sad and I didn't want to have to argue with people who I could see why they were doing like that why they were pushing back and saying well but what if it's true and they have got they are geniuses and they are autistic and all these kinds of things it's like well there's a number of things they're all largely white male geniuses which is means that the majority of the population are not represented I'm not represented. Black people, people of colour aren't represented. Queer people aren't represented in those depictions. You know, us boring, bog standard average people who are rubbish at maths are not represented, all this kind of thing. But I think it's part of that bargaining. Okay, I am autistic, but at least I'm probably could hold myself up as being next to these so-called geniuses and things like that. That's a really problematic narrative. Um, I am boring. Thank you. I am. I'm very boring. Sorry. <laughs> I say this all the time and, and Sai's so like, but you're not boring. I'm like, but I think I am. That's how I feel. Like I'm not that, I just don't feel like an interesting person. Um, so <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. So yeah, so I think. Moving on. I did. Yeah. Moving on. Cause it's okay. eight. 8.15 and I said I'd be done at 8 so but we need to okay we've only got two left I know okay come on we're doing okay um so we've got these um and again remembering none of these are in an order of any description they can come and go at different times you might never experience one of them um if you only experience acceptance that's amazing that's beautiful we are so pleased for you um but just remembering that other people might not feel that um and that that's yeah. okay you know we have and to we hold hope, space well i just said i hope that in the future that is the way it will be that it'll be right. so much so much acceptance within society that there will be an acceptance you could just discover you're autistic and say i'm autistic <laughs> and come out as autistic and that's all you need to do yeah um but yeah sadly it's not the case right now but it could do be do some people could be Oh yes. Okay. Acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am autistic. Um, you know, so really accept it. And I think a lot of times, like I said, if, um, you discover you're autistic through the autistic community, it's much more likely that, that you can have that experience because, um, you know, if you've got uh, the neurodiversity, um, you know, language behind you and you've got people talking about being autistic in a positive way that's much more likely that you can accept yes i am autistic okay but you know you also have negative reactions from other people so mixed reactions from other people um when you disclose to them that you're autistic so you know like some of those things i said before you know you say you're autistic but then somebody says no you're not i don't think you're autistic. and they've met you for like three minutes and you're like gee thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyone experienced that so so you are accepting yeah. but people are yeah giving you mixed responses or you still just don't necessarily have that confidence per se um to just be like i don't care what you have to say i know i'm autistic um yeah. so you've accepted it you're on board with it but maybe you just don't have the the confidence which we might never and that's okay as well to just be like well I, I don't swear. Pass nip you. There you go. That do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Basically, yeah. you put your hand up. So, like, is that? Oh, a thing? yeah. That's just. I mean, it's been. I'm coming. You know, going on two years now of of working through the self discovery with autism, and it's just been eye opening to like witness my partner, and then my mom, and then like my friend. I mean, my friends were kind of already on board because they're all neurodivergent themselves and queer and like we're very similar but um it's it's been interesting 
to see like people shift their perspectives um, because it's not always met right away with, oh my God, yay, you know yourself. Like it's usually like, are you, are you sure? I don't, I don't know. Especially with my mom. Cause she, she's neurodivergent in probably a very similar way that I am. Cause I see a lot of myself in her as I'm discovering this stuff. And she's like, I'm not that. I, I don't have that. I'm not that. So it's like, she's denying my own discovery by denying herself her own discovery, if that makes sense. Like it's, it's a weird relationship when we talk about neurodivergent stuff. Um, so yeah, finally, like I'm getting to a point where I, I do have the confidence where I've done enough research to know that like, no, I, there's no reason, there's no other reason for me to be like this and to resonate with these people in the ways that I do. Like I am autistic. I don't care what people say. And I wear that proudly now, but it took two years and I still sometimes slip into the imposter syndrome stage because things happen. Like my mom, I, I, that's a challenging relationship for me. And it really, it, 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 it challenges how I perceive things. And I'm like working on not letting that take effect anymore. So yeah, it's, it's, it's different in different arenas, right? Like with work or with your social life or your family, your partner, like I'm at a point with my partner, at least that now he's even seeing his own, <laughs> his own neurodivergence and like relating a lot to autism. And I'm like, babe, you know, if you see it, it might be true for you. Like maybe yeah. we should talk about it. <laughs> And that does happen a lot. I mean, not only do people kind of, I mean, one of the reasons why we put this in is because so many people that kind of discover they're autistic and then start, okay, yes, I am autistic. And then they have all these other people saying, no, you're not. And, and you don't feel strong enough to self-advocate for yourself to say, no, actually I am, and this is why. Um, but also you start, when you talk about being autistic um, and you would educate other people, then all of a sudden other people go, oh, <laughs> maybe I'm not, you know, yeah. you know, every time we give a talk, we have people that come down at the end of the talk and go, everything that you've been saying, that really sounds like me, you yeah. know, so <laughs> I think that's something else to acknowledge as well, that, you know, you, you know, that the people around you start to evaluate themselves as well, which is interesting, because autistic people tend, neurodivergent people tend to be drawn to each other, whether right. you know you're like neurodivergent or not. Magnets yes. for each other yeah. because we we need that community to, to like survive and thrive. Genuinely, I, this is what I believe because I would not have the confidence I have and be where I am in my life if I didn't have the online community and the people that I've I've become friends with over the years. Like by accident, we didn't know we were neurodivergent when we first started hanging out. But then, you know, we figure these things out together. So it's just like, I, I completely agree with that. And I do want to say one comment about um, the comment. Uh, someone actually wrote it. I don't remember who I was reading in the comments um, about how, well, every the, the, the response of, well, everyone's a little bit autistic. Like that specifically is one of the hardest things for me to, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. That one really sh shakes my foundation when it comes to the acceptance stage. And I like this because, oh, sorry, you've left. Did you mean to? Um, so it's not not always great with technology. Um, so, um, oh no, I was trying to thought you were just saying, uh, oh, um, I mean, everyone a little, is a little bit autistic. And I do think actually that should be in there because that is something people say all the time. All the and time. It's, yeah. it's whenever you say you're autistic, if someone is really, quite ableist they'll say that <laughs> it's so it's so dehumanizing in a way you know yeah, like it's, yeah. it's just it's not it's deflating like I have I feel like I can't breathe when people say that or when they say I don't look autistic it's like what is it uh, what does that mean? yeah okay, okay so this is interesting, interesting then oh, but we got an echo here I think it's echo. Uh, there we go it. <laughs> um so this is interesting then because yeah so we're talking about acceptance of yourself and then in different spaces it can be hard because you are still being gaslit for your experiences and validated for your experiences of you know you're at that point where you know I know I'm autistic but maybe and this is when we can start talking about the embracing part by just because you're accepting that you've recognized you're autistic doesn't necessarily mean that you've worked out what does that actually mean for me and yeah. how do I explain and convey that so then we're now getting to the point of talking about how you self-advocate so we're not talking about advocates 
and being an advocate, you know, people don't have to aspire as autistic people to be advocates in the sense of you're going out there on behalf of other autistic people. Right. But to self-advocate for yourself is really important. And that particularly shouldn't mean that you feel pressured to use mouth words if that is not your preferred or even, uh, you know, maybe you're not able. You shouldn't feel, feel forced or... Um, belittled for, for for using alternate means of communication for instance so so okay so we can talk then about embracing your autistic identity so that will be about having confidence in your autistic identity so difference to accepting so you're accepting it you've accepted it but this is about having confidence in it that you cannot be shaped shook shook shaken um by other people dismissing your autistic identity so you know maybe having and learning some stock phrases when somebody does dismiss you and saying I was in, informing you it wasn't for a debate wasn't oh you know, god that's so good you know, <laughs> having stock phrases are really important because and, and I've joked about this before I can't t- so I'm a very openly autistic people person sorry if people don't know I'm autistic they must be living under a rock um because <laughs> it's everywhere and so of the very small number of people literally like two or three people who've told me since 2017 or made a comment like I had one it was an academic who said what makes you think you're autistic <sighs> and I was frozen at that point in time knowing all the things that I know because actually at that point I didn't know how to convey because I still hadn't worked out a lot of things. I hadn't necessarily really looked into the fact that I'm very, uh, I'm a hyper fan. I experienced this, hammering home uh, the really important point that Annette always makes, which is the importance of the sensory and how I process sensory information qualitatively different to a non-autistic people. I, I can, I can explain that stuff now. So if that person were to say that to me now, I'm prepared. I know how to respond calmly not that we have to be calm to be clear but for my well-being I know how to respond calmly and explain to that person to shut down that conversation that's not really appropriate Um, because at the time I didn't know what to say so I just went because I have a diagnosis but that's not an answer the diagnosis doesn't make me autistic at all Um, Mm. so Mm. part of the embracing is yeah, having that confidence, connecting to the culture and the community, which you might have been doing throughout all of these different phases, right? right. So this isn't to say, again, that it's only under this reaction or phase. Yeah. Allowing yourself to be authentically you, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean in all spaces. You you make sure you are safe. And so there are certainly numbers of our community who are not safe to demask and not, car- you know, not carry their shields. Mm-hmm. So that might just be in certain spaces, you know, close small spaces where you get to be that safe person so part of a lot of this this is a much more extensive um, discussion for the embracing is that that is about then under embracing you learn your personal profile so what is your personal sensory social emotional and communication profile Um, start to look into the things that we're always hammering home at the point about (laughs) Sai says he's hungry Um, so start to look into things like aphantasia hyperphantasia elixithymia you know, how and in what way are you elixithymic and can somebody support you to work that out? Because it will be hard to work out because you're elixithymic, right? Um, (laughs) Yeah. What's your stimming profile? What are the things that you like and why? Why are those important? So that stuff from Annette has been really key. Me just working out why I don't like fidget spinners, because I always assumed that they were like a tactile thing, which is actually what I need. I need the regulation of, of Uh, tactile stuff which is why I've got like spinner rings and things like that but I've asked a number of autistic people now and they like it for the visual that doesn't regulate me right it's a learning yeah Yeah, a lot of people buy weighted blankets because supposedly that's good for autistic people but not all autistic people like it some people feel totally claustrophobic in it and you know you then you think you buy one and you think well maybe I'm not autistic because (laughs) But <laughs> weighted blanket doesn't work for me, you know, and and that's the same thing with all those things. Is 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 your sensory profile is going to be different from another autistic person? Um, the way that you mask, um, the way that you feel when you're overwhelmed might be different. So it's it's kind of really exploring all that and discovering um, all the things that you know relate, to, and 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 doing that through the autistic community. Um, yeah. yeah, but I mean, I think there's a lot more we can do to understand ourselves 
um, I mean, that's really what me and Chloe are trying to do is kind of find all these things, you know, collect all these things from the autistic community that we found that kind of describes autistic experience and, and see if we can put it all in one place, you know, so that um, people have this kind of tool that they can use to kind of self discovery so that they can self advocate for themselves, but also, you know, self advocate to themselves, you know, okay, there's a reason why I need this boundary. Because, you know, I get really overwhelmed in crowded spaces. So I need to make sure, do I really need to go to that crowded space? Or can I do it another way? Or do I really want to go? You know, so um, the, all those things are incredibly important so that you can thrive as an autistic person. Um, and yeah. part of that self-advocacy, like I say, it's, it's not sufficient in this day and age um, to say, I need support because I'm autistic to your employer, to school, to whoever it might be, because they don't know what that means. And if we say that I want support because I'm autistic, it might also indicate that you're not too sure at that point in time. You haven't done the extensive research that, you, you know, right at the start, maybe of recognising you're autistic. And you don't know that there's all these things. You don't know necessarily about autistic burnout. What's the difference between meltdowns um, and shutdowns? Um, you know, what is autistic inertia? And we're flagging all these things. Go away and have a look because it is, it does change how you understand yourself. Hello, Kat. Um, and that way, once you've, when you've learned these things, you can explain things. So I can explain to people, I can have a conversation with you about this difficult, difficult topic, but this other really difficult topic, I can't have that discussion because I'm a hyper fan it will actually traumatize me because I will be there. I will be feeling and experiencing it yeah. as opposed to, because sadly people, sh you know, don't just take our word for it. Just saying as a boundary, I won't have a conversation about this topic, yeah. you know, but being able to advocate and say, and know why, because we don't always know why. So you know, yeah, I didn't know why. <laughs> being a hyper fan is basically having, uh, thinking very visually to the point where you can, you know, you can, take something apart and put it back together in your brain. Um, and also you have very good visual memory as well, Chloe. So once you have an image, it's there for life, you know, it and that away. can be brought up where I'm the opposite and just describing that to people, you know, that I actually don't think in pictures unless I really specifically make myself do that. Um, so, you know, I have a completely different experience and obviously, you know, all sorts of things can affect that. Like, so, if I was to go to therapy and someone says, visualize yourself at a beach, that would be very difficult for me, you know? Um, so, you know, all sorts of things like that, that, that really nobody's thinking about. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's very interesting that we human beings in general think very differently, yeah. but we all kind of have this assumption that what's in my brain and how I, think is the same as a lot of other people and actually that's not true um, and the more that you can understand about yourself the better that you can advocate for yourself um, and also um, just be able to live your best life yeah yeah and also that's be able to comfort yourself when you when you're not having the greatest time you yes. know and obviously there's so many things we haven't covered here at all which is you know, know a lot of this also might be when you've done a lot of this work which might take years right and that's okay um is you might start to work out other things as well so the intersectionality um that you will see in our community so this doesn't even necessarily cover you know physical disabilities that we're more likely to see in the autistic community so Jason mentioning you know uh, EDS so Ellis Danlos syndrome um, or forms of hypermobility um, are you also dyslexic uh, are, do you also have attention differences like building knowledge of your profile you're not just collecting in quotation marks labels you're <laughs> just collecting information about who you are yeah. because then you know what works for you and and can convey that in a way that suits you as well um so acknowledging and accommodating your challenges so that you can focus on your strengths when you're in that maybe that embracing stage um i think that's everything because i think the next part is much of this much longer yeah so this is so basically what annette was talking about is that so we also recognized we were looking through the unofficial checklist that we we 
uh, sort of borrow from um, Samantha Craft. And we were looking through and all the, they're all sort of statements. I experience or, or do this or X, Y, Z. And we were going through going, oh, that's because of aphantasia. That's because yeah. of, um, do you see what I mean? So we were recognising that actually we now have understanding of why for those statements, for instance. So but we didn't again, years ago. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So building yeah. that knowledge. And so the point is, instead of having... Um, you know, very disparate information everywhere, which has been amazing. You know, the autistic community has been um, uh, doing this where you will see a blog about um, inertia. You'll see a blog or several blogs about masking. You'll see blogs about burnout and things like that. Um, but it is, it's all over the place because it depends on the person who's writing about things. Maybe they are, they're particularly interested in burnout and that's what they talk about. Maybe they're like Kieran Rose who talks really you know extensively about the importance of masking and understanding it and all this kind of stuff so we've been trying to build this tool but it's so ongoing because last week it was only 59 pages and it's now 101 because wow. what we're trying to do is collate all the things we currently understand from the people that we supported or how we've understood ourselves and put it all together so that you can work out who you are and why I'm such a different autistic person to Annette but we're still both autistic and why I'm such a different autistic person to Jace, Jacek, note that way, Jacek, <laughs> right? But we're still autistic and why I'm a different person to Sai, <laughs> right? So, but we're still autistic, mm. right? So it's it's that and then knowing and, and like Annette said, you know, I, I was really, oh, I'll get a weighted blanket, it's on offer. And I was like, no, yeah. I feel like I'm being suffocated <laughs> and it's only five kilograms. Um, Cy and, and my friend Jessica as well were just like, this is great, this is lovely. Yeah. And I'm like, right, well, <laughs> that's clearly not a need that I have then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. and I, yeah, so just, our artistic discovery program, which is, well, six to eight weeks, I think it should be eight weeks, really, Chloe. But yeah, that that is part of that is actually going through your profile, us teaching you about all these different things and, and you discovering for yourself, oh, do I experience this? Okay, how do I experience this? And 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 kind of, creating a chart of your own personal profile for you to have um, and for other people to have to understand you. And obviously that changes and grows. Um, you know, you know, I've talked to you before about even my understanding of, of my gender has changed. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding, you know, um, that I mask my autisticness, but I also understood that I masked my gender and, and kind of discovering at 50 that I'm non-binary. So all those things kind of relate, um, especially when you're autistic, because it's so much tougher to kind of figure all those things out and process that information. Yeah. And that's another important point when I said about the intersectionality that's really not covered in that last little slide, which is, yeah, you might work out your gender, your sexuality, mm -hmm. your other neurodivergences, your physical health, like all the things, um, not just the autistic stuff, if you like. Um, so it's just gone half past. I just want to, because we've still got I've just got four comments that were tagged earlier on. So I just want to um, make sure they get heard. Um, so we've got Sai here as well. So the first non-family person that he disclosed to said, who told you that? I instantly felt invalidated. I embraced being autistic quickly. Thanks to Chloe and Annette's SYA program. Thanks, Sai. Um, and then others in the wider community. Um, so yeah, so to, to, you, we get to a point, hopefully, where it doesn't matter. It still might hurt because it does if people dismiss us, but we're, we're confident enough that doesn't matter. Mm. You you mm. don't validate me, um, I validate me, and my autistic friends validate me, all three of them, because um, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have loads of friends necessarily. Um, <laughs> autistic joke, because also yeah. busting the stereotype that I don't have a sense of humor because I'm autistic. Um, <laughs> yes. We've got, Callum also saying totally accepted myself and cried when diagnosed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people. Callum. Yeah. We've got lovely Amy as well, Amy Goldring. So um, saying to me, so it's Chloe, it's been 18 months since you first confirmed my autistic identity with me. It's still on my journey, but my inner transformation has been huge. Feeling more and more secure in myself, loving myself and mental health is improving so much in a stable and long lasting way. So that's really lovely as well. So yeah, that's what we want. We want people to know, just know who you are. Um, mm. And then I don't want us to go into too much discussion about this necessarily because I know I think people were trying to support this person, but they've um, 
Oh, wait, you are very funny. I know I'm hilarious, particularly when I'm not trying. Yeah. yeah. That's, really <laughs> That's when I'm funny. That's when I'm and funny. I only know one joke. <laughs> I only know one joke, and we can end on my one terrible joke, if you like, um, yes. which I'll give you in a second. So, I, like I said, I don't want to go into this for too long, um, but this lovely person, so Laura Deneen. I think um how do I as an adult explore diagnosis for myself um and Annette and I had this conversation actually with uh, a charity I think we did training for this week and they were asking about adult diagnosis how would they support somebody who'd want one and we actually discussed things like actually work out why you want the diagnosis specifically so the assessment and the process of the diagnosis and the reason we ask that is if it's because you want answers about who you are as an autistic person, I can almost guarantee you won't get them from the diagnosis. No. Like I've, I've probably mentioned, maybe you heard me say it, but it really just gives you more questions than it does answers. And all of my answers that I've had so far have all come from the autistic community. Yep. Um, still wanna know why I did that frog book, right? In the assessment. <laughs> um, if it's and the autistic other community, thing, yeah, I was just gonna say the autistic community um, embraces um, self-diagnosis and, and you know right. that discovering auto you're autistic is enough you right. know yeah and self-discovery um, but if it's for other things if it's that actually it's needed to get the support that you deserve for instance um, and you're in the UK um, you can do, go to the NHS right to choose um, and find assessment and referral in your area um, if you're not in the UK um, for instance, JC, is there a particular method in the States or is it all dependent on the state itself? Unfortunately, yeah, yeah it's it's city based, honestly. Yeah. Um, right. It is not organized at all. And much of it, like like we've talked about pathology before, um, it's really hard as an adult to get a true diagnosis. Um, often you'll get misdiagnosed with BPD or OCD or, you know, a, a, a splattering of whatever um conditions that they want to label you with um like it it really it takes a lot of luck and a lot of privilege because you have to have money for it as well it's not um covered by insurance most of the time so it's out of pocket and it's literally thousands of dollars uh, most places you go so um yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have resources. It's literally city based, like you have to do dig your own digging and there's not a lot of support for it. So if you are in the U United States, I send you my love. Um, <laughs> don't let it get you down because like uh, Annette was saying, and I mean, we've talked about this before, that the community is so accepting of self-identifying. I am self-identified. I, I refuse to try to get a diagnosis again. I was gaslit and dismissed. Like I'm not, I'm not going through more medical trauma just to already know who I am and I'm not going to pay thousands of dollars for it either. So, um, yeah. and, and Laura's still here, which is lovely. So Laura said, yes, I identify yeah. myself, which I picked from being in the community, but I feel I need to have a diagnosis for validation. And they put a question mark. Um, and I understand that. So I, I'm not going to come, from, I, I would be a hypocrite because I do have a diagnosis. Um, yeah. And I thought the same. I thought I needed the diagnosis to validate me. Um, but actually what had happened is because the weight, there's always a weight, yep. um, because of the weight, I'd actually, you know, connected with Annette in different autistic spaces. I was doing my autistic research, um, finding the non-pathologizing and the, you know, life affirming um, <laughs> community resources and things like that, which I say is very disparate. It's blogs. It's some pages like ours. It's things like that. Um, so that by the time I actually had my assessment um, and I got through I don't know why he's waving, so I'm getting confused. Hold on. Um, so, yeah, by the time I had my assessment and I actually got my diagnosis through, it was actually really anticlimactic for me. Um, ah, right, Shula's asking for a wave. So Shula is um, size partner. Um, yeah, and it, became, it just was really anticlimactic for me. Now, that might be completely different for somebody else. They might be really ecstatic and elated and all this kind of thing. Um, but what I would say as well, um, Laura, is that you are most welcome if you are not already to come to one of our closed autistic groups. So let's just flag what they are. So for anybody who is neurodivergent, um, you don't have to have a diagnosis. We are a completely depathologized platform. Um, so as well as having this online um, open access sort of um, 
weekly live streams and things. We also have closed Facebook groups. We have an arts group. We have an animals group. We have a social group that meets twice weekly on Zoom. Um, we have a memes group, which I can't remember why that came about. Um, there's an autistic queer group. There's a caregivers group. So if you're an autistic caregiver of autistic, you know, young people. Um, and we have an info dump vaults, which is um, a 13 years plus discord um, server and things like that. So we've got a number of things. And yeah, you, you may feel that you be, you receive that validation by connecting with autistic people. Um, but if, you know, diagnosis is important to you then and you're in the UK, then look to the NHS right to choose. Um, and yeah, that's a valid, you know, everyone's different. So if, if that's something that you need for yourself, then that's totally, you know, absolutely. go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't want to invalidate people's need yeah. um, for diagnosis. OK, so my terrible joke to end on. Quick, we actually don't quick, have anything. It's 842. Think. I'm in big trouble. Go, go. <laughs> OK. Um, OK. So, yeah, Laura, Laura is in the UK. OK, um, so. Right. We don't I don't think have anything set for next week yet. So I'll look into. But we've booked up for the next month, which is interesting. So I just need to work out why I haven't got something set for next week. Um, so my terrible, terrible joke, which is the only one that I remember. So um, three people uh, die in a car accident and they go to the pearly gates of heaven and they are told that to, you know, to be in, in you know, get through heaven and, and have a lovely eternity um, in heaven, that they have to be really careful not to step on a duck. And they walk in and there are just hundreds and thousands of ducks everywhere. And it's really hard <laughs> not to step on a duck. Um, and so the first person, you know, first person goes in and they step on a duck and um, it's not a great joke, by the way. Um, and then, <laughs> and then um, St. Peter or, or whoever it is comes over and brings just the ugliest person they've ever seen and chains them to them. Um, and, and then that's it. They're, they're stuck with that person for eternity. So the other two are like, well, I don't want that to happen to me for all eternity. So they're trying not to step on a duck. Um, several weeks go past and the second person steps on a duck. And again, ugliest person they think they've ever seen comes over, which is, again, it's not a great joke. Um, and it's tied to them for all, alter all eternity. And the third person is like, right, I'm being really careful. I do not want this to happen to me. Um, and they go months and months without stepping on a duck. And then um, St. Peter comes over with the most beautiful person they've ever seen in their entire life and um, ties and chains them to them. And the, the person says, oh, I don't know what I've done to deserve this just by not stepping on a duck. This is fantastic. And the other person says, well, I don't know about you, but I stood on a duck. Oh. <laughs> just waiting for everyone to get the penny drop. <laughs> it's really not a great joke. I'm so autistic that I didn't get the joke, but that's okay. <laughs> we can just go. It's time to go. You can play it back. Okay. So he's laughing on the inside. Okay. It means that the person themselves was was too funny. the ugly person. So they got... We already yeah. know the final question. If it's Mayo, we know. We asked. No. So he's like, I have to ask it, though. I have to know about... Man, Callum, I'm so sorry. I did say it's a terrible joke. Um, feel free to go and have a look at the terrible joke. Um, anyway, oh, jelly trousers or some paper socks? Jelly trousers, obviously. Why yeah, jelly trousers. Jelly trousers yeah. or sandpaper socks? Oh my That's god! That's like a sensory nightmare. It is. Uh, I would go with the jelly trousers as well. Jelly trousers yeah, and all I think the way. Jelly trousers. I mean, yeah. both of them are terrible. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, both are totally terrible. Yeah, would not enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so okay. much, lovely, lovely Bye, people. We will see you next week. Have our thank beautiful you. outro tunes. Sorry. <laughs> outro tune. Just wave awkwardly until I find it. Bye. Bye.